Hi, my name is Van Studies, and I'm a YouTube personality who is studying to become a priest in the Anglican Church. And I'm making this video because I want to talk about something that I feel is something that really needs to be talked about, and especially in our modern day and age. And it's all about pride. Now, for those of you who have read the Bible, you've gone to church, you've gone to Sunday school, you've heard all of your pastors and your religious family members, you talk about pride, and usually what people say about pride is very negative. As a matter of fact, pride is noted as one of the seven deadliest sins. And I'm sure that you have read certain Bible verses, like in the book of Proverbs, and even in the Gospels, where it seems like God condemns even the notion of being confident in yourself. You know, all those Bible verses that talk about, you know, how God hates those that are full of pride and is resistant to those who are confident. And even the Blessed Virgin Mary in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, even she says that God sends the proud away empty-handed or that he is resistant to those who are proud. I have to read the Bible. I have to read that particular um, story in the Bible to make absolutely sure what she said. But she does say something about how God is resistant to those who are full of pride. And I'm sure that you read those verses in the Bible and you think to yourselves, so God doesn't want me to be proud of myself like I, when I make an accomplishment, like when I get an A on my exam, or if I'm confident in myself that I can do what I can do to be a doctor like I've always wanted to be, or to be a lawyer like I've always wanted to be. You know, God doesn't want me to have confidence in myself to pursue that career. If there's one thing that I've learned so far in my studies of the Bible, and especially on my journey to becoming a priest and studying theology, if there's one thing that I've learned is that you cannot take everything you read in the Bible literally. Like for example, in the Gospels, Jesus says that if your right eye causes you to sin, you're supposed to pluck it out and cast it from you. Or if your right hand causes you to sin, you're supposed to cut it off and throw it away from you. And he follows that with the statement that it is better to enter life maimed than to have your whole body be cast into hell. Now, Jesus doesn't really mean that you have to maim yourself in order to get to heaven if you have a hand that causes you to sin or an eye that causes you to sin, usually talking about the sins of lust and all other sexual sins. But basically, what Jesus was trying to say is that if there's something about you, if there's something in your life that causes you to sin, you need to get rid of it temporarily, if not permanently. Like for example, some people suffer from alcoholism. Everyone just feels the need to drink as much alcohol as they possibly can. And normally for reasons that involve, you know, trying to escape the pressures of life and somehow getting drunk helps them to escape the harsh realities of life which even if it does, it only does it temporarily. Eventually you're gonna to have to come back. And if you've made any stupid decisions, like you decided to drive while drunk, you know, if you're lucky, you'll just get pulled over by a cop, you'll be taken to jail, and you'll lose your privileges for driving temporarily and not permanently. And if you're really unlucky, you'll wind up getting into a car accident that not only kills you, but also kills innocent people who don't even know you so have no reason for being killed by you whatsoever. So that's, you know, if, if you suffer from alcoholism, then what Jesus is trying to say in regards to if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it, pluck it out from your eye socket, or if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from yourself. In regards to alcohol, if alcohol causes you to sin, then you should put it away for a while. And if you feel like you may not be able to do that, like if you feel that it's necessary to get rid of it for the rest of your life, well, if that's what you feel you should do, then go ahead. But you know, you don't have to quit cold turkey. You don't. Just, you gotta learn moderation. You gotta learn to balance everything, and that's the whole point. So when it comes to pride, basically, when you read the Gospels, Jesus tells the story about these two men who were praying in the temple. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee was just so full of himself when he was praying, he was saying, oh God, I thank you that I am this religious person, and I thank you for what I do. I fast this many times a week, I do all of these good deeds, 
and I thank you that I am not like the sinners that surround me every day, and especially this worthless tax collector. Tax collectors who steal all of our hard-earned money. I thank you for that. While the tax collector, on the other hand, he won't even look up to heaven, and he beats his chest and he says, Lord, have mercy upon me, for I am a sinner. Please forgive me, I am a sinner. And Jesus follows that, he follows up with that story by saying, which one of these do you think went home justified? I think he was asking this question to, a, to Pharisees and Sadducees. Basically, he answers by saying that it's the tax collector that went home more justified. Actually, the only one justified. He's the one who's justified, but the Pharisee, no. Because the Pharisee was so full of himself. The Pharisee thought that he was the greatest thing in the world since baked bread. When he was praying to God, you know, he was pretty much going on and on about himself like he was a Middle Eastern Tom Cruise. He was just the greatest thing in the land. Whereas the tax collector recognized that he was a sinful man and he was confessing his sins to God. He was humbling himself. And I think it's another one of those stories where Jesus says those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I think that's the whole point. The kind of pride that the Bible condemns is the kind of pride where you see yourself as greater than everybody else. You think that you're, you think you're like Tom Cruise. You think that you're the greatest thing in the world since sliced bread or pepperoni pizza, or in my case, a cheeseburger because I love cheeseburgers. But basically, that's beside the point. So when you see yourself as greater than everybody else, or even if you see yourself on a certain level, where you see yourself as equal to God or even better than God, so much so to where you feel like you don't need God, then that's the kind of pride that's sinful. So it's one of those things. You have to separate sinful pride from righteous pride. So as far as righteous pride goes, if you're proud of yourself that you put in so much effort to trying to pass your test, a math test, a science test, or a history test in school, and you see that paper, you see that you got an A or a B, and you say, I am so proud of myself for what I've done. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for helping me to ace this test. You know, where you give glory to God, you praise God for helping you to earn that A or that B. And when you take that test home to your parents and the parents look at the test, they say, wow, look at what you've done. I am so proud of you. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. Now, getting back to the whole seven deadly sins thing, pride being one of the seven deadliest sins, you know, you're so, f you know, the best example that I can think about would be the TV show George Lopez, you know, the, the early 2000s, you know, George Lopez, Constance Marie, you know, basically there was this episode where Max, sh he shot off a few fireworks and ultimately burned down the garage. And Angie is trying to reason with George, telling him, please swallow your pride and just take the money from my father so that we can get the garage fixed. And George, being the prideful, stubborn ox that he is, he's like, no, 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 no. I got to do this myself. So basically that kind of pride where you feel like you don't need anybody's help, but you can do it on your own. You know, it's good that you don't want to sponge off of other people, but when you need help, you need help. And if you don't offer the help that people can give you, you know, you don't get the money that you need to pay off certain bills and debts, you know, you can't pay for anything. And before you know it, the bank is taking your house and you and your family, you're living on the streets and you're starving to death. That's the whole point. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins because if you let it, it can kill you. If you let pride consume you to a certain point to where you think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. You think that you can do anything without anyone's help, including God's help. And you're just left out there in that crazy dog eat dog world to fend for yourself. And before you know it, you're living on the streets. You're fighting stray dogs for cold French fries and a trash can behind a Burger King restaurant. You know, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Pride is one of the seven deadliest sins because it's one of those sins to where if you let it, it can kill you. 
And that's the kind of pride that's sinful, the kind of pride that makes you think that you're better than everybody else, where you think you don't need everybody's help, when the reality is you probably do need someone's help, and you see yourself as better than God, greater than God, or equal to God, so much so to where you don't feel like you need God's help. And that's the kind of pride that the Bible condemns. It's that kind of pride that pastors in churches and Sunday school teachers in Sunday school and fundamental Christians try to emphasize or more moderate, more logically thinking Christians, still fundamental and conservative, but logical thinking. That's what they try and that's what they try and emphasize. It's that kind of pride that's sinful. So with that being in mind, I hope that the Lord was able to use me as a vessel to speak through me, to speak to you about a very important message, even though I probably didn't word it like a distinguished scholarly person, like a Harvard professor, but I hope I was able to explain it in a way that you hopefully understand. And with that, I will say thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching this video. Goodbye and God bless in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And no, I'm not going to keep it in church. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody.